And today that good news is found in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 22. Chapter 2, I'm sorry. Chapter 2. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what was stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus, to do for him what was customary under the law, Simon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles, and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phan Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the gospel of the Lord. We'll get to the sermon in just a moment. I thought uh, it'd be appropriate to read today's psalm. The psalm assigned for this Sunday is Psalm 148. Alleluia! Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise God in the heights. Praise the Lord, all you angels. Sing praise, all you hosts of heaven. Praise the Lord, sun and moon. Sing praises, all you shining stars. Praise the Lord, heaven of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, who commanded, and they were created. Who made them stand fast forever and ever, giving them a law that shall not pass away. Praise the Lord from the depth, you sea monsters in all deeps, fire and hail, snow and fog, Temptuous wind, doing the will of God. Mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedar, wild beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, sovereigns of the earth and all peoples, princesses and all rulers of the earth, young men and maidens, young and old together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, whose name only is exalted, whose splendor is over earth and heaven. The Lord has raised up strength for the people, and praise for all faithful servants, the children of Israel, a people who are near the Lord. Alleluia. What a great way to end the year. 
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The fullness of time has come. How can we keep silent? For we have seen God's salvation prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Today is all about praise. Just sing, rejoice, and be happy. There are no more presents to buy, no more meals, maybe, to make, no more gifts to wrap. The craziness of Christmas is over. But I hope that's not the only reason for you to sing, praise, and rejoice. Today, Jesus is presented in the temple. And Simon and Anna are post-Christian models. Just sing, praise, and rejoice. No motive, no agenda, no plan. They just relish the moment, lived in the moment, the moment God showed up. Wow, God, I don't know what to say. A speechless preacher. Now there's an oxymoron, if ever there was one. <laughs> All that is left is praise. But oh my, is praise ever hard? Why? Well, many reasons, in fact. The first one that comes to mind is because this is the first Sunday of Christmas. Everyone seems to be exhausted. Pastors have nothing left, nothing left to say, nothing left in those shivering in the cold to attend worship only six days after Christmas. And now we have confronted, and now we're confronted with those readings that suggest all we need, all God wants is some more praise. And then there is last Thursday, the day the church commemorated the martyr of the holy innocents, those children of Bethlehem killed by King Herod in an attempt to eliminate the one born to be king of the Jews. A reminder that the world in which we live can be a violent place. Isn't praise futile, even offensive, in the midst of the slaughter of our children? When, like Rachel, all we can do is mourn, grieve, and weep at such unspeakable loss in the midst of the unchecked, uncontrolled, unfathomable power in our world. 2,000 years ago and today, the kind of power that exercises revenge instead of responsibility, brutality instead of bonding and belonging, hatred instead of openness, understanding, and love. Yet in the midst of such evil, what can one do but praise? Praise God whose power is known and experienced in the vulnerability of humanity, whose love is felt in pain and loss, whose hope knows no limits. Praise in the, po in the face of perverse power. Praise so as to offer resistance to that which would seek to instill fear instead of trust. Praise is an alternative which would, as an alternative perspective, an alternative reality, 
an alternative worldview that chooses love and inclusion and compassion over hatred and exclusion and heartlessness. Praise to affirm our belief that the world can be different, has to be different, and is different as we experience the kingdom of God both now and in the age to come. We need Anna and Simon this week to help us utter the praise of God that simultaneously responds to God's presence and resists the power of evil. We need them to model the merging of waiting and fulfillment. We need them to give us the courage to trust that God is indeed present and powerful when the world in which we live suggests otherwise. And what about this bitter cold? We live in the middle of the Northern Hemisphere, in the middle of the great continental mass of North America. Our global location means we know snow. We also know hail, frost, stormy winds, freezing rain, ice, sleet. We know nature's unnecessary freezing of water. What are we to make of the psalmist's call to praise? Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and frost. Stormy winds fulfilling his commands. Mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds. I'm not sure if the pickup, if the noises coming from my pickup this morning were praise or grumbling, but I did some grumbling. <laughs> The psalmist reminds us that although we humans have a special place in creation, having been created in God's image, we should nevertheless be aware of the rest of creation. Yes, even a winter storm belongs to God and operates according to God's divine will, doing his word. We're reminded that nature is powerful and dangerous. The seas roar, the mountains shake, the predators are plentiful, and needs have to be respected or we put ourselves and others at risk. Our praise reminds us that nature operates according to God's will. All look to you to give them their food in due season. Even the young lions Nature's symbols of strength, independence, and danger seek their food from God and belong to God and are redeemed by God as well. The psalmist's message is especially fitting in this Christmas season when we're reminded that the Savior was born, he was laid to rest in a manger amidst the animals. Sheep and goats, cattle and oxen. Many of our Christmas carols bear witness, as does Paul in Romans 8, that the entire creation was subject to fertility, groaning in labor pains, waiting to be set free from its bondage to decay, obtaining the glorious freedom of the children of God. Listen to just a few examples. In joy to the world, we sing that fields and floods, rocks, hills, and plains repeat the sounding joy. And also, no more let sin and sorrow reign, nor thorns infest the ground. In all the earth is hopeful, we sing all the earth is hopeful, the Savior comes at last, furrows lie empty for God's creative task. In angels from the realm of glory, we sing all creation 
Join in praising God, the Father, Son, Father, Spirit, Son. Evermore your voices raising to the Eternal One. And in peoples look east, we sing, Furrows be glad, though earth is bare. One more seed is planted there. Give up your strength, the seed to nourish. The psalmist's call to praise is evidence of God's commitment to be reconciled to a rebellious creation. It's a helpful reminder that the act of praise is a fundamentally a relational act. Praise is proper this and every Sunday because praise puts our communion with God back on the right footing. Praise transforms the rebellious. No, I want to know good and evil like a God of Adam and Eve with a more humble and relational your name, O oh Lord, your name is exalted. When we praise God, we acknowledge both to God and to others that the Lord is Lord of our lives and we are not. Praise is a liturgical act that turns us away from ourselves that untwists the curved in upon ourselves nature of our being. As Professor Jim Nestigan used to say, I think Jim had a great respect for carpenters. I think this is an old carpenter's term. At least, uh, I don't know if he was such a carpenter, but uh, he, he certainly liked to talk like one. In fact, uh, one day he came to class, he was bragging because he had been doing some work in his kitchen and had sliced his finger with a chisel. And he was quite proud that the blood had even reached to the ceiling. <laughs> As Professor Nestigan used to say, praise trues us. It straightens us out. It aligns our rebellious will with God. It's tempting to take the first Sunday of Christmas off. I've done it for most of my 30 years. It's tempting to call in a supply pastor to have a lessons and carol Sunday or pretend that we're Quakers and give you time for silent meditation. Anything and everything to avoid the post-Christmas realities of our world. I might even be able to convince myself that I deserve it. After all, there'll be plenty of time to acknowledge and recognize the dichotomous and disturbing world in which we live next year. To do so, however, would have been to miss an opportunity to communicate. Why? In the end, Christmas really matters. This Sunday, is all about enactment, example, embodiment. Just be. Just do. Just let it fly. Just praise, sing, and rejoice. Amen.